gentlemen who heard about the anti-christian pogrom in egypt this week put your hand up none of you none of you heard about the fact that 11 uh, 11 p.m on the tuesday just gone islamic extremists set fire to several christian homes and shops owned by Coptic Orthodox Christians in Al Fawakar village in Saft Al Kamar Al Gabria. You didn't hear about it, did you? Do you know why you didn't hear about it? Because you didn't make it a point to inform yourself about the persecuted church. You don't take the responsibility to educate yourself about the persecuted church. How many of you have heard about the fact that Muslims in Burma, Rohingya Muslims are being persecuted by the Burmese state? Put your hand up if you heard about that. Oh, a number of you. How many of you heard about the fact that Muslims in India are being persecuted by Hindus in India? Put your hand up if you heard about that. Why the difference between hearing about the persecution of Christians and hearing about the persecution of Muslims? It's because the BBC and the lamestream media are your shepherds. They want you to focus in on one thing and ignore something else. They want you to learn about Muslims being persecuted because here in this country, they want you to have a concern about Islamophobia. But how many of you have heard about Christophobia? Put your hand up if you heard it. How many of you heard about that from me? Yes. How many of you have spoken about Christophobia? Put your hand up. Good. I want to congratulate you. Well done. Brothers and sisters, the lamestream media is not worthy of our respect. They were silent about the fact that in Egypt this week, there was an anti-Christian pogrom. An anti-Christian pogrom in a mainly Muslim society, ladies and gentlemen. And it is not an isolated incident. There has been an entire campaign of ethnic genocide and religious genocide in Nigeria and in Syria. Christians are suffering anti-Christian pogroms in Pakistan. Christians are suffering discrimination and persecution in Indonesia and in Malaysia, ladies and gentlemen. And the liberal media will not tell you about it and they will not inform you about it. And all those virtue signaling hypocrites like Gary Lineker, <laughs> name me another one of these virtue signaling hypocrites, Piers celebrities, Morgan. Piers Morgan, all of these virtue signaling hypocrites, they don't want to talk about Christophobia for one reason. Because if all of you understood just how much Christians are persecuted in the Muslim land, you might not want to see Islamization in the West. You might actually join up the dots and realize that the people who are obfuscating and justifying the persecution of Christians abroad might be the same people that persecute you in 20 years time or in 30 years time. The liberal elites don't want you to talk about it because they're all comfortable in their nice jobs, in their nice homes, and they don't want conflict. And they know that if they started talking about Christophobia and about the persecution of Christians in the Muslim world, that that might mean that some of us start to stand up against the Islamists. And do you think that the Islamists are just going to back down? No. So what happens? We have a choice. We either take on the Islamists with whatever energy they come at us at, or 
we back down and let them win. The Liberals can't stomach that fight. They don't want that fight. And so their attitude is to hide the fact that there were anti-Christian pogroms in Egypt this week, ladies and gentlemen. They hide it because if you knew about it, you might start to organise. You might unite as Christians and realise that our denominational differences are not actually important. You might train yourself in politics and in propaganda. You might organise yourselves into networks. You might mobilise and we might start seeing Christian marches on the streets challenging the Islamist hate marches on a Saturday or outside of the embassy of Saudi Arabia who has many of our liberal elites in their pockets and they don't want you to mobilize or to resist. I want to read from the Guardian article, ladies and gentlemen, written by Patrick Wintour in Addis Ababa. And he writes this, pervasive persecution of Christians sometimes amounting to genocide is ongoing in parts of the Middle East and has prompted an exodus in the past two decades, according to a report commissioned by the British Foreign Secretary, Jeremy Hunt. Jeremy Hunt is a Christian who used political office to try and help the church. As Christians, we must recognize that the persecution of Christians abroad is not something that is happening to someone else. The apostles teach that we as Christians are a body of people, a body, the body of Christ. And when one part of that body suffers, all Christians suffer. So the battle of Nigerian Christians and Armenian Christians who are facing an attack by an Islamist government known in, in Azerbaijan is the battle of all Christians. And so as Christians, we must unite across denominational lines, across ethnic lines, across national borders. We must train ourselves in how to resist the persecution of our brethren whether that's using politics or society or economics or culture or art, we must uh, mobile organize networks and movements and activities that lead to a resistance of the persecution of Christians and we must resist. And that includes resisting the Islamists. It includes resisting the liberal progressives who seek to hide this problem. Brother, stop tapping, please. Thank you. I'm having a conversation. Ladies and gentlemen, it includes resisting communists. It includes resisting communists who are harassing and bullying Christians. Ladies and gentlemen, we cannot allow ourselves to be intimidated by anyone. We can't allow ourselves to be intimidated. We have to stand up for ourselves because absolutely no one is standing up for the church. It is your responsibility, not someone else's, yours to do something. If you can act with your hands, do so. If you can act with your feet, do so. If all you can do is act with your words, then speak. But one thing that you cannot do is be passive in the face of the persecution of the church. Any questions, ladies and gentlemen? No question. Yeah, go on. Who is your Lord? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Who is yours? You Who's mean, yours? Your Lord is my best friend. Who's yours? My Lord. Who's your Lord? Big and your Lord. Who's your Lord? Who's a your Lord? A double L. Okay. Any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? 
Go on. Where's the best place to get the news? Oh, right. right. So where is the question? Where, where, ladies and gentlemen, where is where is the best place to get information? Go and look, ladies and gentlemen, into Christian organisations that are supporting persecuted Christians. The Barnabas Fund, Christian Solidarity Worldwide, Voice of the Martyrs. There's countless groups supporting persecuted Christians and they release information all the time, ladies and gentlemen. So, for instance, persecution.org of international Christian concern is another one. And when you hear about it, speak about it. Speak to your work colleagues, speak to your neighbours, speak to other people in your church. And start to think about ways that you can raise the profile of persecuted Christians. Because as you will see, the enemies of the church will want to obfuscate They'll want to muddy the water. They'll want to distract and talk about something else. But we must have a laser-like focus about speaking about the persecuted church. Any other questions or comments, ladies and gentlemen? When people have networked like that, what do you think is the next best step to right. mobilization? Once you've networked, ladies and gentlemen, you've got to get on the street why are we not seeing marches of Christians in the streets of London about the persecution of Christians in Nigeria, about the dangers to Armenian Christians from Azerbaijan? Why are we not on the streets protesting about the persecution of Syrian Christians, of Pakistani Christians, of Malaysian Christians, of Christians in the Sudan? Why, ladies and gentlemen, when we're hearing about Christians being discriminated against by their employers in the UK, are we not organising protests outside of the HQs of those businesses? Why are we not protesting outside of the schools and the colleges that are discriminating against Christians? We have to take our cause onto the street. And here's why, ladies and gentlemen. Because by taking our cause onto the street, we create orbits around the church. We create orbits around Christ. Orbits that people fall into. Orbits that will then lend and lead these people to becoming Christian. It allows us to connect with people in a way that draws them to Christ. And it is also the only effective way to fight the cause of the persecuted church. I want to say to you that if oh, the only thing that your church does to help persecuted Christians is pray and send some money, then they are not doing enough. And you should challenge the leadership of your church to do more. And the reason why they can't think to do more is because too many of our leaders in the church can only think about them and their congregation. And they can't think in bigger scales. And the only way as Christians that we are going to be effective is to think in bigger scales of cooperation amongst Christians. Any other questions or comments, ladies and gentlemen? A lot of Christians buy into the idea of tacitism. Yes. So the question is, does Christianity teach pacifism? No. no. Christianity does not teach pacifism. When Jesus said, turn the other cheek, people say, oh, Jesus is talking about pacifism. Then if Jesus was talking about pacifism, why did he build a whip, a weapon, and go into the temple and forcefully drive out man and beast? Those are not the actions of a pacifist. If Jesus was a pacifist, if you're taking turn the other cheek literally, why don't you take Jesus literally when he says, cut off your hands and rip out your eyes if they offend you? Jesus was using hyperbole when he said, turn the other cheek. Hyperbole is using an unrealistic 
hyper example that is extreme to make a point. And the point is that we as Christians should not act out of revenge. We should not act out of anger. That even our pursuit of justice must be done with a generous heart. Because remember, Christ contrasted his statement about turning the other cheek with the Old Testament law, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Because he's saying that even in the pursuit of justice, we must pursue it in love. But love does not demand pacifism. If your mother is being raped, which one of you men would just stand there and let it happen? And how would you stop the man from raping your mother? You would use any means possible. So clearly, as Christians, neither our conscience nor the Bible teaches pacifism. The Christians that teach pacifism are usually Christians who just don't want to deal with conflict because they are either weak, they are cowardly, or they have misunderstood the scriptures and are genuine in their error, ladies and gentlemen. And I would say that this is a second category error for those that are using the three categories. Any questions or comments further? Go on. Uh, can I imagine that you would encourage every Christian to like, go to the gym and learn self-defense? Yes. So, ladies and gentlemen, I want to encourage all of you that in all of your churches, you should use, if you've got a sports hall, you should use it to develop fitness classes and martial art classes to learn self-defense. Why? Because the state is not going to be there to protect you when you want it. As we Christians have learned in this corner, the police don't protect us when we're being harassed or when we're being attacked. The police just let it happen. The police didn't protect Nisar Hussein in Bradford. They don't protect you when you need them. They will not be there. So Christian man, learn to protect yourself. Learn to protect your community. Learn to protect your family. And if you are a Christian who knows martial arts, or you're a Christian who's ex-army, then go and teach the men in your congregation about self-defense. And so that so that we as a community might be known as a people who can protect ourselves. And I want to end by saying, I'm not encouraging vigilantism. Work within the law, but you can defend yourself within the law and you can organize to defend yourself within the law. Any other questions or comments? Go on. So what do you think on Luke 21 about circumcision? Because if you want me to remain, if you want me to read that question, get the verse and we'll talk about it so when you've got the verse. So what does the verse say? Uh, and when eight days were accomplished Yo, you for, for, the, you, for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus. So, ladies and gentlemen, the question is about Luke chapter 2, verse 21. Don't let the hecklers steal your attention. And when eight days were accomplished for circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus. And there are some people in this park that say, well, Jesus was circumcised. We are circumcised, so we're more like Jesus than you, because you Gentiles are not circumcised. Let's ask me, let me ask you a question. Who here is a Jewish believer in Jesus? No one. Right, what? Are you a Jewish, is what I'm asking. Right, so that's the question I was asking, bro. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's be clear. Circumcision was not given to the Gentiles. It was given to the Jews. Christians are not Jews, and our sign of the new covenant is baptism, not circumcision. And those that say, well, you're not like Jesus, they're usually Muslims, well, let me ask you this question. Jesus called God Father. Why don't you call God Father? 
Jesus prayed standing up. Why don't you pray standing up? Jesus went to Jerusalem on pilgrimage. Why don't you go to Jerusalem on pilgrimage? Jesus didn't eat camel meat because it's not kosher. Why as a Muslim can you eat camel meat? If you want to do the whole who's more like Jesus argument, we're going to win and you're going to lose. Any other questions or comments, ladies and gentlemen? Yes, it's about Palestine. Talk, talk to these people right over there. Go and ask your question, but talk to these people over there. Okay, so my question is, how do you understand what is happening with people always saying free Palestine and then the Jews are evil? How do you understand how right. organized to... So ladies and gentlemen, let, let, let ladies and gentlemen, let's talk about Palestine and Israel. As Christians, our loyalty is to the Christian church. It isn't to Palestine and it isn't to Israel, ladies and gentlemen. Our loyalty are to the Christians in Israel and the Christians in Palestine. That means that as Christians, we should want to see restrictions against Jewish settlers who are persecuting and discriminating against Palestinian Christians. We should want to see that Israel is more discriminating in its security blanket in how it treats Palestinian Christians vis-a-vis -vis Palestinian Muslims. We should also be working towards and want to see a Palestine free from Islamists, free from Hamas, free from Islamic Jihad. I want to see a Gaza that is a Christian enclave, a Christian enclave for Christians of the Middle East. Because it's only when Gaza is filled with Christians and run by Christians that there will be no conflict with Israel. And Israel will have a peaceful border and we will see a Middle East and Singapore, ladies and gentlemen. Because Christianity builds, but Islamists destroy. And the reality is that the Gazans are suffering right now because they are in the grip of Islamists. As Christians, don't take a side. Don't side with Israel. Don't side with the Palestinians side with the church and only the church on these questions and work towards building up the church in Israel and in Palestine. My final thought on this question is this. Israel is a regional threat to some Christians. And as a regional threat to some Christians, we should oppose Israel. But the Islamist movements that Israel is fighting against are a threat to all Christians everywhere. And so it is more important for us to see the destruction of Hamas than it is to see Israel brought to task. Because the Islamists will move on to the Christians when they've finished with Israel and we all know it. Any other questions or comments, ladies and gentlemen? I, I don't drink coffee, but thank you. I am a tea drinker, but thank you very much. That's very kind. Any other questions or am I finishing? Going once, going twice. Then in that case, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to go and grab a coffee. Anybody who wants to join me, you're more than welcome. Just follow me. And we'll uh, we'll go grab a coffee together. God bless.